ilahi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Alhamdulillah, we begin today with a reminder from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in the recitation of this beautiful ayah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains upon us as believers to continue to strive and struggle and to reach the levels of taqwa. If we look at this beautiful ayah, it begins as a reference referring to Ya Yuhalladina Amanu. Yani, o oh, you who believe. It's not beginning with Ya Yuhannas. Even on the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Yuhannas ittaqurabbakum. That O oh, mankind have taqwa of Allah. Have that awareness. Have that yani, knowledge that Allah sees you everywhere. Be, be, be distant from the disobedience of Allah. Strive for the obedience of Allah. All that is in taqwa. But here in this ayah, and in many ayat in the Quran, it begins by calling out to the people that are already people of Iman. And who is a mu'min? Allah knows best. We never ascribe to ourselves, I'm a mu'min. <laughs> but we hope to be. We strive and struggle to be. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, عنهما, he says, when the Quran calls out the people of Iman, pay attention to what Allah is telling you. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering us that have taqwa of Allah, as is the haqq of Allah, haqqa tuqatihi. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He continues by saying, and die not except in a state of being a Muslim. Muslim, aslama, is the one who submits. Mu'min is a higher level. What does that tell you? That yes, even if you're at that high level of iman, you never become stagnant. You never become complacent. You always strive and struggle to improve yourself, to improve your iman. You always worry, will I live and die as a Muslim even? This ayah, something we recite in the khutub in Jum'ah, from the sunnah to be recited, in the, in the khutbah of nikah, of the marriage, the khutbah of hajah, you see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to recite this ayah. And it's a great reminder for us. Today, I would like to begin this conference, this blessed conference, this blessed gathering of people who have come to better themselves. People who have, inshallah, come to seek that sacred knowledge with the great news that alhamdulillah we have our brother Stuart here and he's willing to accept Islam. Allahu Akbar. Oh, that was weak. Texas. Ah. I thought everything was bigger in Texas. The takbirat weren't, man. Huh? Allahu Akbar. This is the great news. This is striving and struggling and, and, and working in times where where we see the results of the da'wah daily. Walhamdulillah. On the way here, my son Yusuf, were in the car. We were scheduling with people who have watched the videos because people like yourselves have shared them. You've put them on your timelines and your WhatsApp statuses, on your YouTube channels and things. Not just from us. Alhamdulillah, people that are calling to take their shahada to accept Islam. And this is where we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us that yes, we are Muslim, alhamdulillah. Yes, we are striving to struggle to be from the people, alhamdulillah. And at the same time, we are facing challenges. We are facing adversity. We're facing people trying to impose upon us values that go counter to that which Allah has ordained in the Quran and what the Prophet والسلام, has mentioned in his beautiful sunnah. But that doesn't mean that we become complacent. That doesn't mean that we start to compromise. That doesn't mean that we start to water down Islam. No, instead, we be firm. Ashaddu bala'an anbiya, thumma salihin. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has told us that the hardest tested are the prophets. 
and then after that, the pious, to know that the test will be out there. But when you are firm upon the Qur'an, when you are firm upon the sunnah of Al-Mustafa alayhi salatu salam, if you are firm upon the way of the Salaf of Salihin, then you will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nusra will come and you will see the futuhat, the victories. What is the victory? إِذَا جَاءَ النَّصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, when the, when the nusra of Allah and the fatih comes, what does it mean? That people will be entering the deen of Islam of afwaja, in large numbers, groups. That's the victory. When people accept Islam, when people recognize the purpose of their creation, that is the victory. That is the glad tiding. That is what we work and strive toward to connect people with their khaliq. To connect the makhluk with their creator. The creation with their creator. We don't care about money. We're here, alhamdulillah, not because we're trying to fundraise, not because we're trying to open an institute, not because we're trying to uh, open mega masajid. No. We are here to call people towards Allah upon the kitab and the sunnah and the way of the salaf al-ummah. We are here because we realize as Muslims we have this responsibility and we can never become complacent saying, okay, I've already, I'm, I'm making salah and I give zakah and I give money to the masjid, khalas, I'm done, I'm good. No. You always struggle to improve yourself. You always strive to do more for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You always challenge yourself. And remember that if you let your guard down, then shaitan, the iblis, is always active. Hassan al-Basri, he was asked, does iblis sleep? Shaitan, does he sleep? Hassan al-Basri said that if shaitan slept, we would get a time to rest as well. But shaitan works around the clock. You're awake, he's whispering. You're making salah, he's whispering. You're asleep, he's whispering. He's trying to come in your dreams, he's trying to whisper. Always. So if shaitan doesn't sleep, neither can we rest from our iman. Yes, we sleep. Yes, we eat. Yes, we do everything. But we always constantly focus on protecting our iman and growing the da'wah and being focused on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained upon us. And inshallah, as a glad tiding from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our brother steward, we're going to now do the shahada with him. And this is the beginning of this blessed conference. Alhamdulillah, with somebody entering the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brother Stuart, tell us a little bit about how you learned about Islam and what you've seen and what you haven't and so on. Well, like I was telling my brothers, um, ever since I was 10 years old, I stopped believing in religion just because it didn't coincide with me. Um, I've had people take me to Baptist church, Catholic church, Christian churches. Nothing ever made sense. So when I was 10 years old, I just said, I'm not going to believe anything. The only thing I'm going to believe in is God. You know, I believe in Jesus. I believe he existed. But to me, there was nothing else but God. Um, you know, 2001 came, you know, with 9-11. And then I started hearing hateful things about Islam. And I already knew that Islam was one of the most beautiful religions that at least I've seen. And I would tell people, talking about the wrong thing, <laughs> talking about evil people. You know, Christians did evil things. Can we really bring, blame Christianity for what evil people did? No, just like we can't blame, you know, Islam for what evil people did, right? One thing that my mother told me, may she rest in peace, is, um, son, there's two kinds of people in this world, good people and bad people. Always stick yourself around good people. Um, so a little bit later, um, through YouTube, I started seeing, um, you know, Brother Uthman and other Muslims. And it, I don't want to say click my curiosity because I already had um, some intent with it. But like I mentioned earlier, you know, it's contradicting. I like to try to be educated and stuff, but I was ignorant in the fact of Islam is just not for Arabics, right? It's worldwide. And uh, the more I started to dig into it, it uh, really is beautiful how 
all over the world, like we were saying in the Philippines and Malaysia. I mean, it's crazy to think, even in Mexico, where my family's from, um, it's not a lot, but, you know, 10,000 and counting. Growing that everywhere. is, to me, that's crazy. You know, some somewhere where, you know, Catholics it pretty pretty strong, right? I never thought I would see it. But, uh, you know, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't like to do bad habits. You know, my mother and father always taught me to respect women, you know, respect men as well. Um, so the more I looked into Islam, the more I felt, hey, this is probably the religion that I, I should be in, right? I'm really Just because it, it feels, like a lot of you probably said, it feels normal, right? It feels like it just, it was that last piece of the puzzle. Everything was together, but you were missing that one piece. And then finally, Islam came that one day, and you just popped it in, and you're like, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Beautiful. So, um, yeah, and I appreciate the kindness everybody has shown me today. I really appreciate it. It is um, a beautiful sensation. I wish more people would get to know um, what being around Muslims is. You know, I, I know there's that stereotype that people are afraid to be around. Uh, I think it's the other way around. If people would just open their mind and be more open-hearted and open-minded, I think they would see a different side of that book. Like our brother Stuart here, there's a lot of people out there that have that fitra, that natural state where they see that Islam is the truth. They know there's only one creator. They believe in Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and peace and blessings be upon all the prophets. But they don't worship them. But they need to be introduced to the message of Tawheed. And that's why I think it's very important that people understand that da'wah is everybody's responsibility. Not everybody's going to be out uh, at the park like, uh, like me and other brothers that are out there, but our brothers and our sisters who share the videos, who make those uh, clips, who post them, you guys are just as much a part of the da'wah because you're the reason the message reaches people. How it reached our brother Stuart from Texas, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. from Dallas. So Masha. Originally in Midland, Texas, but we moved to Frisco about a Frisco, year huh? ago. Yeah. Mashallah. So, you know, not in this, he's not at Balboa Park with me. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, the message has reached him. And I want to give you the good news that alhamdulillah, we ourselves from San Diego, we go down to Tijuana, we go down to Mexico, and Islam is spreading. In, in Guadalajara, in Monterrey, in Mexico City, in the Chiapas, and all over, alhamdulillah, we see Islam to be the fastest growing religion in Mexico and Latin America. And no doubt that the oppression of the Catholic Church in those countries has been there for a long time. But that stranglehold, the chokehold of those priests is breaking. And people are waking up and realizing that they've been lied to, they've been duped, they've been fooled in the name of the cross. And they're waking up to their true fitra, their true natural belief in the one great creator that's not a man, that's not a woman, that's not a white guy on a cross or some naked saint with a horse or some weird stuff that we see down there. Uh, Alhamdulillah, the great creator that created everything, who sent his message through his different prophets, starting with Adam, alayhi salatu salam, and ending with the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So, now that you already have that, any other questions you have? No? All right. Then I have a question for you. Arabic first or English first? Uh, let's do Arabic. Arabic. Woo! Hey, I like it. All right. So say it with me. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Al. Al. La. La. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa. Wa. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammad. Muhammad. Abduhu. Abduhu. Wa Rasulu. Wa Rasul. Allahu Akbar. Weak. You know, when Umar Radhiyan, when he accepted Islam, as we find in the Kutub of Sirah, in Darul Arqam, when they were the Muslims were in hiding at the time, they said takbir, I mean the, the saying of Allahu Akbar, not saying takbir, Allahu Akbar, so loud that the Quraysh heard it in Mecca and they had to scatter. You guys are saying it so light that, you know, across the street they can't hear it. Huh? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. There you go. That's better. All right. 
I bear witness. I bear witness. There is none worthy of worship. There is none worthy of worship. Except Allah. Except Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness. That Muhammad. That Muhammad. Is the servant. Is the servant. And messenger of Allah. And messenger of Allah. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. 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 We see this blessed conference beginning with this blessed step of somebody accepting Islam. Now think, whatever you may have done in your life, whatever wrong, whatever mistakes, whatever sins are all wiped out. Cleansed, brand new, like a new baby. This is the beginning of your new life. The best day of your life. The day you came back to the purpose what Allah created you for. And this is something very important for us to understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create us without purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create us just to live, just to fulfill desires, just to do what you want. That's something animals do. Animals work, and they don't, maybe they don't have a nine to five, but they go out there, they struggle, they strive, they hunt, they eat, they, they, they bring food to their, their offsprings, even birds. You see how they take it back to their nests. So they do that. They reprocreate. I mean, they have children, they have offsprings, they, they continue the species, they do that. They have homes, they do that. But they are just there to exist. But as humans, we have purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to recognize Him and to worship Him and to bring the justice of Islam, the justice of the Sharia, the justice of the Quran and the Sunnah into society, to bring solutions to mankind for the problems being faced by society. So this is why when a, when a person, whether you're born in a Muslim household and you were away or you were raised uh, on, on kufr and you recognize the truth and you accept it, the day you truly accept it is the greatest day of your life because here you have now come to what Allah created you for. This dunya, this world is a test. Huh? This dunya is just there as a test. So everybody going through life will have their own test. Somebody, their test will be wealth. And you think being rich is, is, a, is a bounty, but sometimes it's a test. Look at Karun, you look at Fir'aun, they, 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 were, they were tested by wealth and they failed in it. Then there are those who are blessed with wealth and they're successful with it, like Suleiman salam and Dawood salam. Being poor is a test. It's not always good to be poor. No, that's a test as well. But when you strive and struggle for the haqq, for the truth, and Allah, you reach it, even if you're poor, even if you're struggling financially, you are successful. So what is the success? Is recognizing your creator, submitting your will to your creator, living by what Allah has ordained. That is true success. And this is the first step to accept Islam and then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our brother steward and us and everybody else steadfast on the truth. To have istiqama, to have steadfastness upon Islam and to live as a Muslim and to die as a Muslim. And know this, that life is terminal. Meaning everybody will die. Nobody will leave this planet without dying. Everybody has tried People in the past, kings, uh, you know, scientists, they've all tried to live forever. But the reality is, this life will end. And if you recognize Allah, and you worship Allah, and you live upon that, and you die upon that, then no matter what, you were successful. And if not, no matter what, it's a failure. Inshallah, I want to mention something here which I found to be very interesting. We mention ayat of Qur'an, we mention sahih ahadith, but sometimes you get a lesson from something you don't expect. I was reading about Alexander, the one who conquered many, they call him the great, I don't know about all that, but you know, I was reading about him. And I found a quote, and I verified that this is something that's been attributed to him through the books of history. Alexander, you know, he's from Macedonia, 
And you see him conquering many lands at a very young age and moving very fast. And, and, he, and he acquired great amounts of wealth and power, you know, and he had some strange things about him. You know, we don't praise him in that sense. But as a military man and as a king, he found him to be very successful. A time came, and this is around where the Indus Valley in the northern area of Pakistan, southern Afghanistan is today, that he had some defeats, and he had some health issues and so on, and he was about to die. Now, interestingly, at that time, he had the best physicians, the best doctors, the best medical professionals of that time. Whoever, I mean, he had wealth and he had power, so he gathered them. He told them, you have to save me. Whatever it costs, don't worry about money. I have jewels, I have gold, I have treasures that I've, you know, robbed and, and conquered and this, I will pay. And whoever you need, as far as doctors, you know, medicine men, whatever, magicians, whatever you need, we will gather them. But I want to live. I don't want to die. So they told him, you know, we're sorry. You know, we, there's nothing we can do. You're at the time of death and you're going to die. He gathered his generals and armies and he said, you know, go and find, use all the resources of my kingdom to stop me from dying. They said, no, you can't do anything. You're going to die. Huh? I mean, I was reading this, it reminded me how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran, Kullu nafsin maut. Every soul shall taste death. There, at that time, when he realized that there is no way around it, that he is going to die, he made a declaration. It's very interesting. He said, when I die, I want that when they take my body to my burial ground, that they put my treasures on the ground. And they step over them while taking my body. All that wealth, all that money, the gold and jewels and those things that I strove and I struggled and I killed and I did all this to collect, put it on the floor and have them step over them as they're carrying my body. And he said, I don't want my family or friends to carry my body. I want these doctors, these physicians, these medical men, these medicine men, I want them to carry my body. And he wanted to show the world that all that wealth in the end, did nothing for him. They're stepping over it. And all these medical professionals could do nothing for him. They're carrying his dead body. And he said, I want you, when you have the kafan on me, I want you to leave my hands out. Leave my hands outside the coffin. So people can see that I'm leaving this world with my hands empty. This is something that we as Muslims should take a lesson from. You know, in this world, you're not going to take wealth with you. You're not going to take money with you. You're not going to take cars with you. You're not going to take houses with you. You're not going to take corporations with you. You are going to take your aqidah, your belief will be there. Your amal, your deeds will be there. That's what you need to count. That is the final fruit of your life's labor. Is how was your belief and how are your amal, your actions. Inshallah, uh, with this, alhamdulillah, I'm going to wrap up my uh, section and we'll uh, talk a little bit about the program and the conference, inshallah, and also uh, kind of discuss about, I know a lot of people have questions and we want to give a, a good amount of time for question answer, inshallah, but we'll kind of talk about the format and so on. Inshallah ta'ala, uh, I'm going to bring...
ان شاء الله we want to benefit from our keynote speaker the one that uh, really deserves to be up here more than me our sheikh and our beloved uh, sheikh karim uh, may allah reward him and bless him and once again um, i know sometimes you may see me in the front of things but uh, sheikh karim mashallah he does the hard work you know day and night up late at night worrying about this conference worrying about you worrying about the ummah uh, i don't want to praise him in front of him but this is something that truly i see uh, a great dedication may allah accept it from him and increase it and accept it from all of us um inshallah tonight we'll also have the special sisters uh, and this is a, a recommendation that came from my wife originally actually that you know we should have some uh, talks especially for our sisters and we're going to be doing that so they can ask questions in a very open way and they can discuss things so we can benefit our ummah we want to make sure we focus not just on brothers but on the sisters and inshallah on our youth we're going to be having special camps for the youth and inshallah we want to make sure that every segment of our community is involved in the da'wa um after the sheikh's talk then inshallah we'll break out with the sisters as well and then we'll have our qa as well and inshallah we'll let you know for tomorrow and the day after so we can benefit by the allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, wahdahu la sharika lah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina muhammad, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa azwaji ummahat al-mu'minin, وعلى من اتبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين my dear respected brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jazakumullahu khaira for making it here today as we inaugurate this uh, mission uh, we would like to Welcome all of you, inshallah. Can someone help me with my mic here, please? Can you lift it up a little bit? Look at the uh, verse behind me on the screen. Uh, this chapter is called the Ankabut, the spider whip, and it is chapter twenty-nine of the Quran. And this is the second verse. And it comes after Alif Lam Mim. We know that uh, there are Alif Lam Mim chapters which were, were revealed in Medina, Al Baqarah wa Al Imran. But we have also four Alif Lam Mims which were revealed in Mecca. Alif Lam Mim Al Ankabut. Alif Lam Mim Rum, Alif Lam Mim Luqman, and Alif Lam Mim Sajda. Four Alif Lam Mims. This is one of them. So this chapter is Mecca. And this is the second verse, like I mentioned. And a lot of the uh, scholars of tafsir, my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, mentioned that these letters, which we sometimes find at the very beginning of chapters of the Quran, we don't know exactly what they mean, but one of the wisdoms behind their presence at the very beginning of the chapters is to alert you, is to get your attention. 
like, hey, and then you say the message. When you hear something that, what does Alif Lam mean? What is that? You're awake. And then the verse that comes immediately after it is really what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to pay attention to. Alif Lam Meem, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ Alif Lam Meem, Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. So really, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is getting your attention to the following verse, not to the alif lam mean. So the message here, that you will be tested. You will be tried. Not because you say, I believe, you're going to be left alone. And regardless, by the way, of where you live, you will be facing a lot of tests. As a matter of fact, the Sunan, the Imam al Nasai, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, radiyallahu anhu, qalu al Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the following question. One of the Prophet's companions, Brother Stewart, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the following, the following question. Ya Rasul Allah, O Messenger of Allah, Man ashaddu nasi bala'a? Who will get tested the most? Who will be tried the most? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Anbiya'u, the Prophets and the Messengers. Imagine those are the people Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala chose to convey his message. They will be tested the most. Thumma salihuna, then those who are righteous and pious. Thumma al-amthalu fal-amthal. Then those who are close to them when it comes to quality of faith. Look at this now. And every person will be tested in accordance with the quality of his faith. Look at this now. فَإِنْ وُجِدَ فِي دِينِهِ صَلَابَهِ فَإِنْ وُجِدَ فِي دِينِهِ صَلَابَةً If the quality of his faith is up, زِيدَ لَهُ فِي الْبَلَاءِ He will be, his test will be elevated to. Uh, and that's the distinction, brothers and sisters in Islam, that Muslims have from other people that we know why, or the wisdom why, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us into this world. Look at this. تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير. Blessed is he, Allah, glorified and exalted, who is able to do everything. Look at this. الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم. Allah created death and life in order to test you. In order to test you. So that's why we're here in this world, to get tested. Now, we always, brothers and sisters in Islam, get this question. Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know what will we do with our test? Yes or no? Assalamu alaikum. Yes or no? Yes. Allah knows what you will do. Allah knows that. But is Allah's knowledge evidence for you or against you? Yes or no? How? How? 
Last Ramadan, the night of the 27th, I was asked this question, and, and the sister who asked that question, she made her acceptance of Islam contingent upon receiving a logical answer. It's obviously a logical question, but she wanted to receive a logical, something that can make sense. So I told her the following. Imagine I'm, you're in college, she's in college, she was in college. Imagine I'm your professor, and I've been teaching you this subject for years, and I know your level. I know how good you are with my subject, and I tell you, I'm going to give you a test, and I know what you're going to do with it. I think you're going to fail it. So I'm just going to give you F. You got it or no? Do you, do you get it or no? Is that fair? What she's going to say, let me go through the test, please. Can I just try? Maybe I will disappoint you. That's exactly why we have to go through the test. I mean, can we have something? I mean, So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best what will you do with your test, and that is why you have to go through it in order to become an evident against you. The following verse to this verse, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَن يُتْرَكُوا أَن يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ The word that is used for test is not really test. The word is used is what? Fitna. You guys know what fitna is? Fatan to dhahab. When you expose the gold to the fire, what happens? It gets sorted out and you end up with the best of gold. So one of the keys behind being tested, Allah will bring the best out of you. Allah will purify you more, will make you a better person. Your heart will be strengthened every time you succeed in one test you're stronger and stronger that's why the word used for testing is not really testing in arabic it's fitna then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you walaqad fatanna alladhina min qablihim and by the way you're not the first one we tested those who came before you. Like we tested the people of Nuh. We tested the people of Ibrahim. We tested the people of Lut. We tested the people of Shu'aib, Madian. We tested the people of Egypt and so forth. Actually, in that chapter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cited the history beginning with Nuh alayhi salam. If you look at the chapter carefully, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَلَبِثَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا خَمْسِينَ عَامًا Indeed, we have sent Noah, Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, to his people. He spent 950 years calling them to Islam. And then Ibrahim, then Lut, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, the issue that we have now, and then Musa, and so forth. Brothers and 
sisters in Islam, in a nutshell, we get tested two ways. The first way, or the first fight, whatever you want to call it, is in the area of al-qadr, in the area of predestination. What does it mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained certain things upon you that you had no choice. Can I ask you these hypothetical questions? Did you choose your birthplace? Just say yes or no. Did you choose your birthday? Uh, the, doesn't mean that celebrate your birthday, by the way. huh? But the day on which you were born. Okay, let's stay away from that. Did you choose that? Yes, come on. Yes or no? Did you choose your parents? Did you choose the environment you're supposed to be brought up in? So all of this was what? That's a test for you. That's a test for you. Likewise, can you choose your death? When, where, how? No one knows. So this is the first area that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote in the preserved tablet certain things upon you. Now, to succeed in this test, you have to do two things. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam paired them in a beautiful hadith which you should memorize today. The hadith is compiled fi sahih al-imam Muslim. Hadith Suhaib, Abi Yahya, Suhaib al-Rumi, Abi Yahya, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ فَإِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٌ I'm amazed at the lifestyle of a believer. It's all good. All good. Your lifestyle is all good. Why? فَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ سَرَّاءُ when he receives something that he is pleased with, something that makes him happy, the believer will say what? Will say what? Why does he say Alhamdulillah? The believer, why? Because he knows he got this because of who? Not because of me. That is what we call the actual gratitude. The actual gratitude or the actual expression of being grateful to Allah that you realize with certainty that whatever you have, you name it, comes from Allah, not because of you. That is the beginning of being grateful right here. Because we look at the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, two looks. There is the Qaruni look and the Sulaimani look. I'm just trying to see the looks on your faces upon hearing these terms. Huh? Sound familiar to you? Qaruni look, the Qaruni perspective and the Sulaimani perspective. Who is the Qaruni and who is the Sulaimani? Obviously, Qarun is the richest man history ever known. The richest man. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْكُنُوزِ مَا إِنَّ مَفَاتِحَهُ لَتَنُوءُ بِالْعُصْبَةِ أُولِ الْقُوَّةِ the keys to his treasures to open the locks would need over a dozen to carry it. So what about the treasures? What was his issue, Qarun? 
one statement he made. What did he say? Qala, he said, Innama utituhu ala ilmin indi. I got this because I'm smart. Right here. Tayyip. What about the Sulaimani look? I'm referring to the scene when Prophet Sulaiman, alayhi salatu was salam, and I mean by Sulaiman, Prophet Sulaiman, the son of Dawood, alayhi salatu was salam. When the Ifritun min al jinn, one of the jinn, said to him, I can bring you the throne of the queen of Sheba from Yemen. Now visualize the geographic here. Yemen to Jerusalem. Yemen to Jerusalem in a blink of an eye. You blink, it's here. When he actually realized that the throne is here, did he say, I got this because I'm smart? This is because of what Allah bestowed upon me, not because of me. You're getting that. That's the first entry to being grateful. Why this is important, brothers and sisters in Islam? Because when you realize that, when you realize that, and you express it to the people, not in a boastful way, you're really directing people to the source. You're giving da'wah. You're letting people know that you can be like me. Just go to him. But when you say, I got this because of me, so you're directing people to what? Come, I'll teach you. And I'll give another example, and I love this example. The only time jail was mentioned in the Quran is in Egypt. And who entered the jail? Unjustly. That's another thing too. That's why I think twice before you go there. So he's in jail. He's conducting himself as a believer, as a Muslim, inside the cell. Everybody around him is obviously a criminal. He's the only innocent man. He was accused of something that he did not do. You know the thing about the women there, right? What happened? So two inmates saw two different dreams. So they came approaching him. You're not like those people. You're, you're different. Your character is different. You're... You're not the same like us. Can you help us interpret that dream? Look what Prophet Yusuf, how Prophet Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam utilized this. Okay, I'm going to interpret it for you. But I want to give you some da'wah first. By the way, this is not all I know, the interpretation of the dream. I actually can tell you what kind of food you will receive today. He said, لا يأتيكما طعام ترزقانه إلا نبأتكما بتأويله قبل أن يأتيكما. Look at this now. Look at the da'wah. What is next? Nobody memorizes here. What's next? ذلكما مما علمني ربي. This is what my Lord taught me. It's not because of me. He taught me that. You can be like me. What did I do? I disassociated myself from the way of those people. They do not believe in Allah. And they disbelieve in the hereafter. We call this what, ya ikhwa? Disavow. Or you call it what? Disassociation. What about who, who are you going to follow? 
ولا أب أنا أم لويل تو ذا واي أوف ماي فور فاذرز إبراهيم إبرام آيزاك أند جيكوب سو ذا ريزن واي يو سبيك أباوت ذا باونتي وأما بنعمة ربك فحدث in order to connect people with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فهذا هو الشكر. When you're grateful in this manner, Ibn al-Qayyim said that this is what makes you keep what you have and Allah will give you more. What is the evidence? وَلَئِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ What? لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you are grateful to me, I'll give you more. I'll give you more. But the first thing that a believer does to pass this test is to actually being grateful. But in that manner, being grateful is not just a lip service. No. Being grateful that you also use that bounty in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I read a stats, ya ikhwa, that I don't know how accurate it is or not. The majority of the owners of liquor stores in America are Muslims. That's what I, I don't know how accurate it is, but if this is true, at least I know maybe 10 or 15 who own liquor store. I want to ask you, is it something that shows your gratefulness for being wealthy or giving wealth? Is that how you show your gratefulness to Allah that you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outlawed, made it haram? The, the major, also the, mo, a lot of Muslims deal in that medical marijuana industry. They, it's money making for them. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam clearly says, إِذَا حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ شَيْءٌ حَرَّمَ ثَمَنَهُ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala labels something to be haram, then it's haram to trade in it, to sell and buy in it. Because you're promoting the haram. طيب. What is the second type of test and what should you do? The second type of test is the things that you consider to be bad. You consider to be bad. Why do I say that? Because according to Allah is not bad. And, and that is why read carefully how our classical scholars translated the sixth pillar of faith. What is the sixth pillar of faith in Islam? The sixth pillar of faith. وَالْإِيمَانُ بِالْقَدَرِ The belief in the predestination. خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ How do you translate خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ? Come on, speak up. I'm not going to beat you up for making a mistake. Come on, guys. I mean... Let's let's be alive here. I mean, we're we're here to seek knowledge. Okay, you you gotta you know you gotta you gotta. We're here to learn. I'm not gonna mumble while people sitting out there and you know. I gotta make sure that you're on the same page with me. Okay, how do you translate khairi wa sharri? Come on, don't be scared, man. Bad according to who? You, not to Allah. You got that? Because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will never permit anything bad to happen. And what I mean by bad, absolute evil. Only human can do that. The type of evil which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may permit to take place is what we call purposeful evil. And evil that ends to be what? Don't worry, I'll expound a little bit more on this. The hadith regarding reciting Surah Al-Kahf every Friday is authentic. 
We're reminded of a story in this chapter, chapter 18 of the Quran, steward. You should recite that chapter every Friday. The hadith is authentic. Although there are some experts of hadith question its authenticity. But the hadith is authentic. Chapter 18 of the Quran. Two prophets. And our brother from the extreme Sufis are not going to like that. They prefer Al-Khidr to be a wali, not a prophet. Because for them they say, Maqam al-wali fawq al-nabi. The status of a wali is higher than the status of a prophet. Can you imagine that? Astaghfirullah. For them Al-Khidr is a wali. But for us, Khidr is a prophet. Because he said clearly, وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَنْ أَمْرِي I didn't do this in my own. Allah revealed this to me. You got two prophets seeing the same identical scene, but they reacted differently. Who's the second prophet in the story? Musa, Moses, alayhi salatu wassalam. When we say alayhi salatu wassalam, steward, we say, may the peace and the blessing of Allah be upon him, because we love him. The same thing we say about Jesus, we love him. We love him dearly, Jesus. But the ship, Musa, Al-Khidr uh, dug a hole in the ship, Musa got upset, Al-Khidr did not get upset. Al-Khidr grabbed a boy who's under the age of puberty. He killed him. Musa got upset. Al-Khidr was not upset, although he was uptight about it because it wasn't easy. You know the three, the three situations, right? I want to ask you why Musa was upset, alayhi salatu wasalam, and why Al-Khidr was not upset. Okay, that's a very dangerous statement. And I'm going to spank you now. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I can say that's what they say. Al Khidr knew the, the unseen. When you say the unseen, what do I mean? And the only one who knows the unseen is who? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may give you and me peace. Little peace. You got that? That's a, that's a danger. Yeah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving al-khidr. Listen, we dug a hole in the ship because there is a guy out there who confiscated these ships. He took them forcefully. Now when he sees that there is a defect in the ship, why well, take something to fix? I just wait another 10 minutes, another ship will come. Get out of here. This little boy, would he have grown up, he would have been a kafir, a disbeliever. He would have disbelieved. Not only that, he would cause his parents to be disbelievers. So the ent entire family will be thrown into hell. Now, if this boy dies before the age of puberty, we believe as Muslims, anyone who dies before the age of puberty goes to Jannah. Anybody. Even if he was born to a non-Muslim family. Very important here. What did I make of a statement? Is this called what? Huh? Unrestricted without identifying. You may say that. You may say any child who dies before the age of puberty goes to Jannah. Can you say that? Yes? Yes or no? Come on, don't be afraid of me. I'm a very peaceful man. Yes. Right? But can you identify? Can you say this child goes to Jannah? 
because he died before the age, age of puberty? No. You can't because you don't know. You got that? And we have actually a beautiful hadith fi Sunan al-Imam al-Tirmidhi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadith Abi Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu. One day he went and attended a janazah of a young boy from al-Ansar. When he returned, Aisha could see that he was a little bit down. Aisha is his wife. Radiyallahu anha. That he was a little bit down, you know. So she wanted to cheer him up a little bit, you know. فقالت, she said to him, لَهُ, How lucky this little boy is. عُصْفُورٌ مِنْ عَصَافِيرِ الْجَنَّةِ He's one of the birds who will be flying in Jannah. He looked at her and said, ذَلِكَ يَا عَيْشَ Please, don't go there. That's not our business. We don't know. فَإِنَّ غُلَامَ الْخِضْرِ طُبِعَ كَافِرًا The young boy in Al-Khidr was to die as a disbeliever. You don't know. فَالشَّاهِدُ or the important thing here is any one who goes through a calamity rest assured that if you're patient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show you the outcome is really good, it's not bad. And I really want you to read this portion of Surah Al-Kahf. This is your homework. And count, the, count how many times the word patience and its derivative, different derivatives, was repeated in that one and a half page of the surah, or two pages, I think, two pages. Find out how, count how many times the reference to patience in that portion of the surah. Look. إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِيَ صَبْرَ You're not going to be patient. وَكَيْفَ تَصْبِرُ عَلَى مَا لَمْ تُحُطْ بِهِ خُبْرَ سَتَجِدُنِي إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ قال فإن اتبعتني فلا تسألني أه. ألم أقل إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا count why because that's what we should do when we are experiencing calamities we should be what patient and الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم when he saw his future wife at the time أم سلمة crying over Abu Salama in front of the grave. What did he say to her? Patience is to be displayed when you are hit with the calamity right away. I want to ask you something. What is the difference between patience an acceptance of the calamity. We call this عبوديه الصبر وعبوديه الرضا. The servitude of patience and the servitude of acceptance. Accepting what Allah decreed upon you. When you are inflected with the calamity, what are you supposed to do? Accept it or being patient? The first one, to accept, I'm sorry, this goes against the nature of a human. I'm sorry. No. See, our religion is very realistic. You're supposed to be patient, that's it. But accepting it normally comes what? After a while. It's mandatory to be patient and it's recommended to be what? Accepting. But later on, you should be accepting. So if you do two, those two things, you succeed in the first type of test. Did I lose you already? 
So we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us steward into this world to be what? To be what? Tested. We get tested two ways. The first way in the area of what? Al-Qadr. Something that you have no control over. But there is anything you can do regarding Al-Qadr? Ah, dua. Making dua. Finally, you're... You got something right there. Dua. The Prophet وسلم, said what? لا يرد الدعاء إلا القضاء. Only the dua can prevent the qada. Now some of you will be confused. How is that? How is that? You see, everything that is written in the lawh al mahfuz in the preserved tablet, no one knows about it. Not an angel, not a prophet. Only who's know it? who knows it? Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes in that preserved tablet that you are to go through this, but if he makes dua, he gets this. You're getting that? So both are what? Assalamu alaikum. Both are what? Written. Both are written. And Allah knows which one you'll choose. That's why when you make dua, the part you didn't make dua for will be implemented. And the part that you made dua for, provided that, that your dua is dua of a certain person, someone who believes, will be abrogated. Anyone knows a reference to an evidence in the Quran for this? Anybody? Yamhu Allahu, Surah Al-Ra'd, chapter called Al-Ra'd, the, the thunder. Yamhu Allahu ma yasha'u wa yuthbit wa indahu ummu al-kitab. Allah will abrogate whatever he wills because of your dua or affirms it, and he has the preserve tablet. All right? So you can make dua that may edit your qadr, something that Allah ordained upon you. Shahid or the important thing, let's move on here to the next type of test, that when you showcase patience, when you're inflected with calamities, and showcase gratitude, being grateful. When you're blessed with a bounty, you succeed in that test. You did good, A plus, right here. Can I ask you a brotherly question? Which is more difficult, exercising gratitude or patience? More difficult. Okay, no, I don't like, uh, no collective answers. Raise your hand and I'll pick you. Yes. Oh, you're in the khutbah today. We can do that. If you're an INT today, you're exempt from that. Yes. Yes, the brother in the back. Gratitude. You got to tell me why so. I want to ask you something. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains something upon you, what can you do about it? You're really left with what? Patience. I mean, there is nothing you can do about it. All what you can do, maybe hit yourself in the, in the wall or something. عندنا في مصر يقول لك اخبط دماغك في الحيط. But gratitude, you have options. Ibn al-Qayyim, by the way, authored an entire book about this, which is more difficult. al shakir a rich person who is grateful, or al-faqir al-sabir. 
a poor man who is patient, which is more difficult. He actually suggested what the brother mentioned, that the grateful rich man, because he has the reasons not to be grateful. He has the money. He has the resources. And he gives this up for the sake of Allah, that means. So this is the first type of test, brothers and sisters in Islam, in the area of the Qadr. What should you do? Wake up here, Ali. What should you do when you're inflected with a calamity? Huh? Come on. What should you do when you're inflected with a calamity? Allahumma ja'alna inda al-bala'i min al-sabirin. That's why sometimes, oh Allah, at the time of test, make us amongst those who are patient. Ya Rabbi. And when we're having something good, make us grateful to you, Rabbi. That's how you pass the first test. Ready to move on to the next test? The next type? Ah, uh, this type is a killer. This is the type where you have a choice. And this is in the area of do, don't do. Do marry, do not commit adultery. Do pray. You have a choice. Be a Muslim. Did anybody force you, steward, to be here today? Did anybody beat you up? It's a choice. Actually, if somebody beat you up, that defeats the purpose. Your Islam is invalid, actually. <laughs> because it has to come with what? Sincerity. It has to come with truthfulness. That's one of the conditions of la ilaha illallah, isn't it? Seven conditions, right? Truthfulness. You have a choice. You have a choice. That's why it's difficult. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has two types of commands. Qadari, the first one, Shari, the second one is Shari in the area of the Sharia. Like, for example, the you being a Muslim, I want to ask you something. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants all of us, all the human beings, to be Muslims, wouldn't He have done it? Yes or no? Can someone give me an evidence from the Quran? What surah is that? Yunus, 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 ya rajil, Yunus, you're questioning me, la Yunus, hundred dollars, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَآمَنَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كُلُّهُمْ جَمِيعًا أَفَأَنْتَ تُكْرِهُ النَّاسَ حَتَّى يَكُونُوا مُؤْمِنِينَ This verse came right after what? فَلَوْلَا كَانَتْ قَرْيَةٌ آمَنَتْ فَنَفَعَهَا إِيمَانُهَا إِلَّا قَوْمَ يُونُسَ لَمَّا آمَنُوا You're getting that? I'm right, Sheikh? Hundred dollars, my brother. Hundred dollars, my brother, after the lecture. Hundred dollars, my brother. You're right, Sheikh doesn't sell here. If Allah wills, everybody will be a Muslim. Everybody, if Allah wills. Shuf, shuf, hadi al ayah at the beginning of what? Al shu'ara. In nasha nunazil alayhim min al sama'i ayah, fadallat a'naqum laha khadain. Imagine, if I, will, if I want, I will. Make them see a sign of me that they will do like this. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. But Allah left you up. It's your call. It's your call, but I'll see you in the day of judgment. It's exactly how it is. So this is the second type of test. Now, why this test is so difficult? Because you have three enemies who wants you to fail. 
You know, like they are shooting arrows at you. They want you to flunk that test. And occasionally they succeed with us, with anybody, including your brother here, everybody, they occasionally. But the level of success there is, who is the first enemy? You. You. First enemy. Why? Why the nafs? The nafs, brothers and sisters in Islam, doesn't like commitments. Doesn't like delayed gratification. The nafs wants what? Now. Now. That is why the only way to fashion this nafs, I think the verb is to tam, like a horse, taming a horse, right? Is that good English? Taming a horse? Team, team. I, was not. I learned English in high school in Egypt. Huh? Team. Come on, come on, my nafs. I love you, come on. Can we go for Fajr, please? I know you want to sleep. Come on, but my nafs, come on. You know, you know, hell, you know, there is. Come on, let's save ourselves here. Come on, come on. And, and subhanAllah, this is how you, you know, uh, I remember this when we were growing up, when we would speak like that, people would say, oh, this guy is crazy. This man is talking to himself. Actually, this is what you need to do. Wallah, this is what we need to do. That's why we read in the, in the biographies of some of our righteous predecessors that he would dig a grave in his house. Dig a grave, a hole in his house, and he would go and lay down on it a little bit, and he would talk to his nafs. Uh, what do you think about this place? Huh? Well, let's get ready for it. Come on, let's go pray. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. And uh, subhanallah, the only way you can save yourself from your nafs is not to be responsible for your nafs, but to always have Allah between you and your nafs. What did the Prophet say? وَلَا تَكِلْنِي إِلَى نَفْسِي طَرْفَةَ عين. O oh Allah, do not let my nafs take charge of me the duration of the blink of an eye. Not, not even less than that. Always, O oh Allah, come between me and my nafs. Because you have no control over it. And especially brothers and sisters in Islam, when you allow your nafs to engage heavily in something, after that, you want to stop your nafs from doing it? No, not going to do it. No, we're going to do that. Come on, let's go and do that. Actually, it becomes like a lion. Your nafs becomes like a lion attacking you. Attacking you. But that's the first enemy. Who's the second enemy? The human shaitan. There are some human who have the physics, the body of a human, but their hearts are what? Your friend. There are some people when you look at them, you remember death. Oh, that's bad? SubhanAllah, Wallah, this is good. You remember the hereafter. There are certain people when you see them, you remember marijuana. Ah, nightclubs. Isn't that true? When you look at them, be careful. Look at this. Al maru ala dini khalili. You are the same way like your brother, like your friend. Be aware who you take for a friend. Because this friend will affect you. 
actually the human affect earth negatively what is the best piece of earth on earth Mecca, the Kaaba. Why was it bad at the time of the Prophet? Because of who? Isn't that what the Prophet said in his way out? What did he say? When he looked back and what? Wallahi, by Allah, inni la'alam, I know, annaki ahabbu bilad illahi illallah, the most beloved land on earth to Allah. وَلَوْلَا أَنَّ قَوْمَكِ أَخْرَجُونِ Has it been for those people? Remember the man who killed hundreds of souls? Why did he have to move from there? Why? And why, why was he directed to go to the other place? Good people. But be careful who you admit into your life, beginning with a spouse. I see a lot of youth. A lot of youth attend our conferences, by the way. And I love that. That's a good sign. Be careful. Take your time. Choose your spouse. Because you don't want to admit someone in your life who will ruin that, who will become an enemy to you. And brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, look at hadith. Uh, I believe in Nu'man ibn Rashir, radiallahu anhuma. The two parables the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to make you visualize the influence or illustrate an illustration of the influence of companionship on you. What did he choose? The likeness of a good company is like what? Musk or the one who sells musk? Why? Why the one who sells perfume? His influence transcends without you even knowing it. His breath. You're going to walk out of there. Your wife is going to ask you, where you been? Because you smell good. I didn't put anything on, I didn't buy any. That's the influence. Now look at the other one. And again, with all due respect to the profession of blacksmith, there is nothing wrong with it. It's lawful. But you're going to smell like smoke. Again, the message here is what? That companionship will influence you while you don't know it, while you don't realize it. So be careful. ولذلك the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said what? لا تصاحب إلا مؤمنا Don't you ever take for a friend except someone who's what? A believer. And you're gonna, if you're going to take him home and offer him dinner or lunch, one level up. ولا يأكل طعامك إلا تقي Make sure that he has taqwa. Consciousness of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. So this is the second enemy. Who's the third enemy? Shaitan, the jinn. Every one of us is given to shaitan. A responsibility to one of the jinn. And shaitan doesn't want you to submit. Doesn't want you to follow. So those are the three enemies who wants you to fail. Now, I understand that none of us will score 100% on that test. We all fail. Anyone here who didn't fail? Raise your hand. Huh. By the one in whose hand my soul is, if you do not fail, if you do not commit sins, Allah will do what? Don't assume this is a license. No, this is hope. Allah is giving you hope. كل ابن آدم خطاء. All of the children of Adam are sinners. وخير الخطائين توبون. So the best 
of the children of Adam, those who commit sin, and right away they return to Allah, right away. So like the first test, you have two things. What were they? The test in the area of Al-Qadr, what were they? As-sabr wa shukr This test, every time you flung, what should you do? Astaghfirullah. Ya Rab, turtu ilayka. Astaghfirullah. Forgive me. Forgive me. Hakad. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَلَمْ يُصِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ Those when they commit fahisha, immediately they return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are the two areas, brothers and sisters in Islam, that you're going to be tested as. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained Abu Nas, and I want to close here, that we live in America, and all of this, by the way, was an introduction to my presentation. So, but my presentation will be in less than 10 minutes, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained upon us that we exist in America the year 223 when a group of our wider community called the LBGTWXYZ managed to have a lot of privileges. And these privileges are enforced upon us by law, unfortunately. And we as Muslims are law-abiding citizens, and we must be this way. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu awfu bil Because we have a covenant between you and this country. If I am to live here, I'm going to do my best to abide by the laws. Now, this particular group, they gone so much to the extreme that they are going after our children, unfortunately. And a piece of advice to my Muslim brothers who are here, and sisters, parents, mothers, please, if your children go to public school, think about it twice, thrice, because the environment is contaminated, like they say, is corrupt, is polluted. I spent some time in Maryland, in Montgomery County, actually, the county where they had this. Parents were begging the school district just to opt out their kids from these classes when they are conducted. said, no, you have to attend. And if you hear the stuff and see the stuff that they teach the kids. Now, the Prophet وسلم, says, every newborn is born straight. I know the hadith doesn't say that. It says what? Fitra. What is fitra? Subhanallah, one of the things you know, after we are in the womb of our mother, 120 days, Hadith ibn Mas'ud, Salim Muslim, after 120 days, Allah will send an angel who will write what? Four things. What is the first one? Male or female. Did the Hadith mention anything in between? Let them choose after they confused. Come on. Did you say that? This is written. 
male or female, there is no third gender here. There is no queries here, no. Now, when you're delivered, who is responsible for protecting that fitra? Who? You. You gotta remind your son. Come on, man. You're a man, man. My son, I saw him wearing kind of reddish, kind of. What is this? You're a man, man. What's the red color thing? Come on, man. You know, sometimes when they talk like, you know, one of the issues that we have in the Islam, even the Islamic schools, that most of the teachers are sisters, with all due respect to the sisters, because they are the only one who can compromise some income. Because, you know, you know, Islamic schools don't pay much. For brothers to work in Islamic schools, they really have to sacrifice a lot. And they have to believe in the mission. So basically, the boys are interacting most of the time with who? Females. So the kid comes home talking in a very, you know, speak like a man, man. What is this? Talk like a man, man. That's what you need to do. You know, come on. You know, my daughter sometimes have that heavy voice. What's going on here? Allah curses women who try to mimic men. Talk like a girl. Be, come on, be, 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 be. Come on, be a girl. That's, you dress them like, you enforce that. You talk to them about it. Now that right is taken away from you. And Sheikh Uthman maybe can share with you what is happening in California. If the child reports that the parents are not allowing him to entertain the idea of a shadow, the important thing here is we are confronted with this. Now, brothers and sisters in Islam, Muslims are not apologetic. You know what apologetic means? You know what that means? You know, many Muslims, unfortunately, are like that now. Please forgive me, I'm a Muslim. You know, please forgive me, I'm a Muslim. No, Muslims are not like that. Muslims are Muslims. They stand for what they believe in respectfully, with kindness. Recently, a group of imams in America came up with a document called Navigating Differences. If you read that document carefully, it's very apologetic, very weak. Enough that they did not mention one single verse from the 80 plus verses in the Quran that talks about the story of Lut, which is in biblical terms, Sodom and Gomorrah. We have over 80 verses that talks about it. They didn't quote one single verse. And this is the subject matter. Don't tell me that they were trying to make the document concise. It's already three pages. And you know what? They quoted Quran, but not that. They quoted verses. If you go back, they quoted verses, but not that. Why? Because the verses from the Quran that talks about that is straight forward. Not beating around the bush. Straightforward. I think the agenda of this group is to move you from the area of being resolute about the lawfulness and the unlawfulness of this sexual behavior to the area of what? Maybe it's okay. They don't want you to take the position of Lot, Prophet Lot. They want you to take the position of the wife of Lot. 
What was the crime of the wife of Lot? What was her issue? She wasn't determined. She was wishy-washy. And by the way, this wasn't her heart. And subhanAllah, something so amazing in that story. And I love the narrative of in Hud. The narrative in the, in the chapter Hud. That subhanAllah, you notice that when the two angels came to destroy the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah, they stopped by who? To do what? To give him what? Of what? The reproduction. That act is going to kill Adam's race. Because a man with a man, a woman with a woman doesn't produce. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starting the story, the narrative of that story in Hud, with giving a glad tiding to a barren wife. Why, why did Sarah do like this? فَصَكَّتْ وَجْهَهَا وَقَالَتْ عَجُوزٌ عَقِيمٌ I have been barren. To show you that marriage is to produce. That relationship is not going to produce. Now, Lut السلام, held his position. And this is what Muslims should do. He held his position until the very end. Although they attacked him, they harassed him. Imagine if you're having guests and they come to rape your guests. Imagine that. But he still said what? Inni li'amalikum min al-qaleen. I resent what you're doing. But his wife in her heart, she was what? He was not determined. And that's what you have to be careful of. That was in her heart, by the way. Read carefully the story in Al Hijr and in Hud when the angels instructed Lut leave before the sunrise and make sure no one of your family looks behind. Did you read that? Didn't you read that? Who looked behind? Because her heart looked behind before. When your heart looks behind, your limbs will look behind. We're getting the message. That's what they want to move you to reconsider. You see, there is a domain out there, and the brothers of the conference, you got to let me know how long I have. I can talk until Fajr, inshallah, by the will of Allah. So, as long as you're allowing me, I'm going to talk. Uh, I don't know. I mean, nobody is telling me. So I can't, I mean, I can go on. Just, shall I just go on? All right. L look at this now. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded our father Adam not to eat from the tree, what was the command? The actual command was what? Don't come near the tree. This is what we call what? Saddu al-dhari'ah. Blocking the way to a greater evil. You see, when shaitan wanted Adam to eat from the tree, Adam alayhi salam, for a long time in the garden, he is what? Determined. This is haram. Astaghfirullah. I'm not going to come near it. This is haram. He's what? What we call what? Resolute. So, what was the trick of Satan? I'm going to show it to you. Just try it. Come on. قال يا آدم أو آدم هل أدلك على شجرة الخلد وملك لا يبلى He moved Adam عليه السلام from the domain of being determined that this is haram to another what? Domain. Maybe. That's where shaitan hunts you. And that's where they want you to go. That's where your children want. That's why they are going after the children. To move them. That's wrong. That's wrong. 
Uh, these brothers, these imams, scholars, whoever they are, may Allah guide them and guide us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Rabb, Wallahi, we're, we're, we just mean good out of this. We, you know, ad deenun nasiha It's very, no, that's not, Muslim should stand for the truth. This behavior, brothers and sisters in Islam, will destroy this country. And if you care about this country, you got to do the right thing. And by the way, it will get to you if you don't do something about it. And the Prophet ﷺ depicted this in a way out of this world. When he said, imagine a community getting on a ship. Some of them ended up in the upper level and the others ended up where? You know the hadith, right? In the lower level. And the people in the lower level, they had no access to water directly. In order for them to get water, they had to what? Look, look at this now. Out of goodwill, by the good intention. They had good intention. You know what? We're, you know, we're disturbing our brothers in the upper floor. You know, we, we don't want to disturb them. We love our brothers. We don't want to disper- disturb them. So let's just dig a hole in the ship so we get our water. They, they mean good, by the way. We, I mean, we're, we're saying that, the, you know, the people who legislated these laws, they mean good. They have good intention. But look now, if the people in the upper level would allow the people in the lower level to do that, what will happen to the entire ship? But don't say this is away from me. This is not away from you. This is in your backyard. And we owe this to this country, by the way. You know, we come to America, we benefit from it, we have freedom. I, you can't have a conference like this in a Muslim country. You can't have it in a Muslim country, with all due respect. You can't speak freely like this in a Muslim country. I'm not raising something, but I'm telling you the reality. Give something back to this country. Stand up for what you believe in. Don't be apologetic. Stand up. And listen, do this in a respectful, legal way. There are legal ways. But if you give in, let people know that this is wrong. And this is where we stand as aim. That is why we actually recommended for imams not to sign that document. Because you're signing on a lot of compromises. And why? Because of the apologetic environment in this document because of the fact that you're not letting people know that this behavior is dangerous. We have empathy for people who feel this way, but because we care for them, we're going to let them know this is wrong. We're going to let them know that this is bad. And this is going to affect the entire society. Jazakumullah uh, khayra. Let me test you now quickly. How long do I still have? Huh? Fajr? No, not Fajr. Oh, time is up. So, why were we created? No, that's not what I said. To be tested. So Allah created us to be what? Tested. What is the first type of test? What do we call it in 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 a kawni qadari? To succeed in this test, can someone quote a hadith? Come on. Say Ajaban li amri al mu'min. I'm amazed at the lifestyle of a believer. When you receive something good, you should be what? Alhamdulillah Rabb. Something bad, what should you say? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajuan. Alladheena idha asabathum musibatun qalu inna lillahi. You passed that test. Why the second test is the hardest? Because you have a choice. And not many people succeed in it. The majority of people flunk it. And because of how many enemies you have, what is the first one? 
you. What is the second one? The human, Satan. What is the third one? The jinni, whispers, whispers. To succeed in this test, what should you do? Astaghfirullah. By the way, tawbah. Astaghfar, tawbah. We all flung the test occasionally. We all do, right? We all do. That's why. Right away, go back to who? Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned three things are the password for being happy in this world. You want to be happy in this world. Three things. Al-shukr, wal-sabr, wal-istighfar, wal-tawbah. Look at this. The keys for happiness in this world. When you're giving something good, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rab. Alhamdulillah, Ya Rab. I love you, Ya Rab. Thank you. When something bad, when you commit a sin, astaghfirullah. You do not need anybody to die for you. Reach out directly. Jazakumullah khaira. May Allah reward you. May Allah make this weekend uh, a weekend of, of knowledge. And this is how our conferences are, brothers and sisters in Islam. If you think that here you're here to be entertained, that we're, we're going to give you... Uh, God made me funny or something like that. We don't do that here. It's all lectures, all knowledge, all knowledge. That's how authentic ilm mission uh, is tuned. Knowledge, and we address contemporary issues, issues we, we connect with the time. But we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who benefit and make us amongst those who implement what they learn, Ya Rabbil Alameen. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والحمد لله رب العالمين. I have a question. Oh, Sheikh Osman, you still here? MashaAllah. Oh, no way. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. جزاك الله خير. والله every time the sheikh speaks, I like to always be sitting and benefiting. Sheikh Ibrahim Zidan as well. We should always benefit from these uh, ulama, even if they are humble not to call themselves scholars. For us in America, these are our ulama and our shiuch and our ru'us, our heads, who have been standing firm on tawheed and firming firm on the Qur'an and the Sunnah in the face of adversity. I don't want people to think that we're coming from outside with uh, any kind of uh, uh, hostile attitudes. We're from here. <laughs> I mean, we're from the U.S., we live here, we're a imma in masajid, we are du'at on the streets, we give lectures, universities, we deal with the same challenges others do. So we're not just talking the talk, we walk the walk. And he, we're not sitting, myself, I work in the med device industry, I have to deal with this stuff at work. We go to universities, we give lectures, we get these questions. So when we speak, we speak with experience. And we hope that our nasiha, our, our well-wishing for our fellow imma and leaders will be taken as that uh, a nasiha, as with love and with respect. Um, inshallah, just uh, to give you kind of a breakdown of the program, um, we are not able to bring food inside to the facility, so we are going to be giving breaks to eat. Uh, tomorrow, inshallah, at 1.15, we'll give a break for lunch, and at 7.30, we'll give a break for dinner, so you can go out to the halal establishments or where there's good food, and inshallah, you can eat. If you need the resources where to go and things, inshallah, our brothers that would have the volunteer uh, necklaces and badges, I don't know. Um, inshallah, I can help you. Tayyib. Um, next. Inshallah, we're going to take a break now to get ready for salah. Our dear Imam Majid is here, inshallah, he will be leading us. And uh, inshallah, after salah, the sisters will go to room 103. We're going to have a sisters only powwow and uh, a workshop and a session. No, brothers, you can't go. I don't care what you identify as. Um, 
But inshallah, we want to have the sisters to have that time to benefit, inshallah ta'ala. And for our brothers here, inshallah, you can stay and we'll have a panel discussion here. Uh, so the sisters after salah, please head to room 103. For the brothers, please stay here, inshallah ta'ala. So we can have a question answer. Now we do get a lot of questions uh, through email. I think right now we're at 25,000 plus emails and the one message fund just for the question answer let alone the others, you know. So you being here get to get ahead of all of that and ask your questions, inshallah ta'ala. So benefit from this opportunity. Wa jazakumullahu khairan.
people and put people down. That's not our intention, nor AIM's intention. We, we truly believe that these brothers, who used to say, thinking about it is this and all of that, and, you know, and, you know, don't oppose their agenda because, you know, this is not good. Just stand by their side or something. They, they changed. They changed. They have taken a more reasonable position on the issue. So from that, we say, Jazahumullahu khaira. That's a good thing. May Allah reward them. But still, that is not how a Muslim should be. You see, the, the danger of entertaining the idea that this could be okay is uh, you. Like I said, you, in my previous talk, that you move from the domain of being resolute, that this is haram, to the domain that could be okay. That's a dangerous domain. That's where shaitan can hunt you. Uh, we as Muslims, I think these brothers who signed this document did not fully grasp it. And I think they just looked at the names. Okay, my body signed it, so I'm going to sign it. But they don't understand that when you sign on something, you're signing on it its entirety. It's not, okay, I'm signing on the part I like. No, it doesn't go this way. It doesn't go this way. Muslims should stand firm on these issues. Because these are moral issues that, will affect you sooner or later. And it, it does affect us now. Many Muslim parents cannot send their children to the public school, to the uh, private schools. It's, it's very costly. Tuition sometimes is $1,000. And if you have two, three children, no way you can afford that. So you have to send your kids to the public school. And now your, your kids have to deal with that in the public school system. So we need to stand. And I think these brothers, these imams, respected imams and scholars, students of knowledge, they were appealing to the liberal in America, help us out, accept us. When you have people that Islam allows you to differ from them and still work with them, the people of the book, Christian and Jews, I can't force them to be Muslims, can I? I can't. I actually supposed to treat them with respect, with kindness. Although I disagree with their tenets, the tenets of their faith. So you have die hard uh, Christian and Jews from the Christian and Jewish community who are against that. So why not put your hand with those people and work together? instead of appealing to the people who will never even consider working with you. But again, the document is much better than it used to be, than their position. If you trace back their position, it was absurd. With, I say this with respect. It was disgrace. That's the word, disgrace. For a Muslim to say something like that. And alhamdulillah, you know, you see, فَلَوْلَا كَانَ مِنَ الْقُرُونِ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ oh, We'll go back to Huda. Sahil, we we'll go back to Huda. This is Hud. فَلَوْلَا كَانَ مِنَ الْقُرُونِ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ أُلُوا بَقِيَّةٍ يَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْفَسَادِ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You see, I, we need to realize, brothers and sisters in Islam, that we are not in the business of making people happy or appeasing them. That's not your job. If you decide to take on that podium, to take on that mic, your position is to clarify to the people right from wrong, to draw the line for them. Whether they want to follow you, whether they want to become your fans or not, that's their business. That is why you're going to find a lot of us saying things that are unpopular. 
in the mainstream Muslim community. But we strive. We're not saying we're perfect. We make mistakes sometimes, for sure. But to, at least our intention is to be in that area that people, people are desperately needing someone to let them know this is wrong. Not someone to say, oh, this is wrong, but you can do it. It's okay. You're going to be fine. No. No. No, messengers do not do that. Prophets do not do that. We're not messengers, no prophets, but we claim to be their followers. So we're going to do like them. You understand? We're not here in the business of twisting and navigating differences. We don't do that. There is no such a thing called navigating differences. Differences are differences. We're going to say this is wrong. This is very dangerous. This is going to destroy this country where we live, where you live, where you're going to have children here, and they are planning to live here. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. So, Sheikh, it's a good segue for my next question. Uh, so, acknowledging that this, this is the best country for a Muslim to be an authentic Muslim, the same way alcohol and types of zina, which are halal, but Muslims are prepared here to push it back. Corporate world, educational, institutional, everywhere. Alcohol is halal over 21. A lot of zina with the strip clubs and whatnot. These are halal. And we have a mindset and we have that power to push that back. Somehow, the same Muslims are scared to push back on this haram issue. So how can what Islamically or socially can we develop skill set or knowledge set that we are able to push back this strongly? Zakallah khair. Um, just to be clear with terminology, uh, zina is never halal or alcohol. I think you mean legal. Right? I got you, yeah. I know, but Islamic terminology, legal and halal don't necessarily mean the same thing. So I just want to be clear. I understand your question, but for the clarification. So the brother's question is just like it's legal for people to drink alcohol over a certain age or to do zina or interest and things, while we still are very clear that this is haram, why is it so difficult for some of the imma and masajid and the Muslim community to be clear about the fact that uh, LGBT, TV, XY, Apple, <laughs> this and that is uh, haram and we take a stand against it? You know, it's interesting uh, as somebody who was raised in America myself, um, there are lobbies and there are uh, think tanks and there are people who push certain things in society. Um, growing up, we used to see a lot of things about smoking, like you know, posters with cigarette and movie stars smoking and commercials. They wanted to make it look cool, you know, and they used to market to kids, which is a horrible thing to do. You know, you're, you're marketing to little kids. Uh, something that is well known to cause a lot of harms in society. And, but it was legal until uh, people just got sick of it. And they were like, look, we, we don't want to be walking around people smoking. And now you see smoking is no longer cool, right? Now you can't smoke indoors. You can't make billboards with smoking that is, that is geared towards kids and so on. The same thing is true for alcohol. They have a lobby that pushes for alcohol. America tried prohibition. And because it was not backed spiritually, it was a horrible failure. Um, but again, there's a lobby, right? Uh, the LGBTQXYZ community also has a lobby. And I have not seen a lobby make the kind of progress in the short time that we have seen them make. So again, I don't know who all backs it, but they've got some backing, right? Um, and I'm not going to get into any kind of conspiracy theories here, but... Definitely from the political aspect, both sides of the house. You know, they're, they're, nobody's willing to take them on. But at the same time, I, I do want to say, as Muslims, we never fear anybody except Allah. And when we speak the truth, Allah will give Nusra to Islam. Our brothers and sisters just have, unfortunately, a, a weakness sometimes in their yaqeen, in their tawakkul, in their, in their reliance upon Allah. So they start to think that if we 
kind of damper the issue or give ambiguous answers or you know go here and there. It'll be easier for us to get accepted. But the reality is until you take a firm stance, you cannot stand against this. If you're going to be weak, they will see that weakness and crush you. Right? And we've seen the church do that. We've seen the Pope crumble. We've seen most mainstream Christian churches today bowing down to the rainbow flag. Um, and we are the last man standing, Muslims. And this is why, uh, I mean, a lot of brothers, and I had uh, a brother named Sneeko, if you don't know who he is, you can see his videos on our channel. And one of the things he said that brought him to Islam and people like Andrew Tate and other people is because they saw that Muslims were the only ones taking a stand and being firm. So when we are firm, others will join us. And if we are wishy-washy, then you can't. You know, there's an example, one of the shiuch he was giving is, he said, if you put your feet in two boats, you know, one foot's one boat, one. For a little while you can, you know, balance, but sooner or later the boats will start to spread and you will fall. So you have to take a clear stance, and alhamdulillah here, with our shiuch here, Sheikh Ibrahim and Sheikh Karim, under their leadership, alhamdulillah, we've taken a clear stance. And we live in this country, and we want good for this country. And we have had, I personally have had many non-Muslims, Christians and Jews that have come to us and appreciated us taking that stance. And say they will stand with us. So, inshallah, we hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that just like any other sinful behavior, just like incest, just like bestiality or anything else that is against the fitrah of insan, we will stand against this and say it's haram and say it's bad and it's bad for the country, it's bad for our children, I mean, every which way, inshallah. And we'll be clear and firm by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with tawfiq has been the law and in the abilities from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, so we all come from communities, most of us do, where the, um, the masajid that are not on the haq, that are not on the sunnah, that are adopting liberal viewpoints are the majority, and they're the most powerful, most wealthy. So how can we go back to our communities and give da'wah and make a change in the communities where the majority of the people are following these liberal views and the people on the sunnah are the minority? Jazakallah khair. I think the Imam for Salatul Maghrib he gave us the answer by reciting the verses at the end of Surah at Tawbah. So this is the, the, the job of every single one of us. Wazifatul Waqt. The job of the time that we're in now is ilm, is to seek the authentic knowledge, the wahi, the revelation from Allah, the Quran, and the Sunnah of the Prophet, والسلام, and to seek it in the proper way with the proper manners, and return back to our communities and be patient with them, with manners, with goodness, so that we convey the message. Our job is to convey it. Not to play with it or temper the message, but to convey it with the best manners possible. And we have in the Prophet والسلام, the best example. And the Prophet والسلام, when he conveyed the message to people, he was very firm in conveying it, relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Mashaykh was saying, This is the deen of Allah, Rabbul Alameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. So the results is not in our hands. We convey the message, Alhamdulillah, the khair, the goodness in the Ummah. So being kind and being gentle and being generous with the people and being firm upon the truth and conveying the message and not necessarily this one point or the other point, but teaching the basics of the deen. We need to go back to the basics to learn our aqidah and to learn how to worship Allah, to learn how to purify our hearts, to keep our fitrah clear and clean. And this is how, inshallah, the, the, the results is not in our capacity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of all things. And the barakah and the blessings in this ummah and the blessings and the barakah by following the way the Prophet والسلام, is something that is always attached to the more the person follows, the more the barakah and the blessings he would see in his 
da'wah in his life, and we don't have to see results in our even lifetime. We're not responsible for this. The most important concern for each and every one of us is that when we die, we die upon the deen of Islam. As Imam Ahmad rahimahullah used to say when he would make the dua and someone heard him, Allahumma amitni al Islam wa sunnah. Allah make me die upon al Islam wa sunnah. Al Islam is sufficient for all of us, but why he rahimahullah would mention the sunnah specifically when he sees the deviation away from the sunnah? So the word sunnah was added. Not that this is something extra to the word of Al-Islam, but because it's to make it very clear to be upon the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, but with manners. The second surah that was revealed in the Quran, it was said, Surah Al-Qalam, in it, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ The Prophet ﷺ has the best manners with conveying the true message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy, inshaAllah. Uh, for coming here. So uh, my question is like for Shiyuk to address like this issue uh, about other Shiyuk, uh, you have the knowledge and uh, the wisdom to address those. But for a common people, like, you know, sometimes we cross limit when you talk about these things. Like we might backbite them, we might, uh, you know, get into sins. So, uh, but at the same time, we need to give nasiha to uh, our brothers and sisters. How do we balance this and how do we approach this? Uh, if somebody asks you about a person who has deviation, for example, but uh, you're not a scholar, you're a common person, um, how do we approach this issue? Barakallah Um, I, I truly think to be more effective when it comes to that. Keep the persons away. Keep the names away. Unless you're warning against that person because he's obviously devious. Just address the issue, the subject matter. Something that we notice at our time and age that we associate the truth we judge the truth based on who said it <laughs> Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu he said اعرف الحق تعرف أهله learn what the truth is you will find out who is on the truth it's a very profound statement. The problem that we're doing exactly like the non-Muslims who we rebuke when they call us a blanket judgment that we're terrorists. We tell them, listen, if there are some people who did crazy things, that's not us. Don't judge us based on those. We're doing the same thing. We're judging the religion we're, because that person said that. You always have to go back to the source. And this is the blessing that we have in our religion, that your religion is preserved, the source is preserved. Throughout history, we had devious scholars who came out with crazy things you cannot imagine. Where are they? The truth stands because the source is pure. So you have to go back to the source. So I would advise you not to engage and that person said, if there is a, an issue out there, go ahead and study that issue well, research it. Ask someone whom you trust in, in knowledge to help you understand it and convey the issue. Just say, قَالَ اللَّهِ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ You see, there is a big issue, brothers and sisters in Islam, when we allocate ourselves as authority. That's wrong. Don't do that. No, just tell them Allah said, don't do that. The Messenger وسلم, said, don't do that. I'm just balagh. I'm just conveying it to you. And here is the evidence, and the, here is how the Sahaba understood it. I think this is the ideal approach at this time and age. 
in order to avoid, you know, all these negative consequences of... Because, listen, if you don't change it, you are at fault. That's the thing. And it's going to get to you. All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for answering our questions. Um, the question I have today, inshallah, is uh, kind of related to what we discussed in the, the, the prior lecture before Maghrib. Um, you know, with the understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah, uh, with the understanding of the righteous generations, how exactly can we um, understand the concept of free will with respect to Qadr, inshallah? Well, like I, I mentioned, you have a free will when it comes to matters of religion, sharia. Uh, you know, you, you get to choose. But Allah knew what you will choose. And he wrote it. You understand? I'll give you an ideal example uh, that I always, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, a story that I always tell. When I was imaming in Maryland, a brother came and he wanted to receive some counseling on, you know, his marriage. And so, you know, he arrived and I noticed that he did not pray Asr. So he came to my office. So I said to him, why don't you go pray Asr, inshallah, and I'll wait for you. So he said to me, Allah doesn't want me to pray. Quite frankly, at this time, I wasn't well-versed in the subject of the names and the attributes. And by the way, the Al-Qadr is, is connected to that. So if you don't master the names and the attributes, you mess up in Al-Qadr. That's why many people mess up in Al-Qadr. Because they don't comprehend how to deal with the names and the attributes. But subhanAllah, I came up with something that I found out it's very actually deep. So I said to him, why don't you go and make wudu and pray asr and say Allah wants me to pray? Do you know what Allah wrote for you? Well, that like anyone who uses al-jabr, that you don't have a free will to justify his wrongdoing, tell him that verse in Surah Maryam. Do you know what Allah wrote for you? What they say? What is the ma'lum that Allah sent you a messenger and a prophet who tells you if you pray, you're going to go to Jannah. If you pray, you're going to stay away from Fahisha. If you pray, you're going to lift your spirit. You're going to become happy in this world. If you pray, you're going to be a good person. You have revelation from Allah that says that. هذا معلوم. This is known from the revelation, from Allah. So you abandon that and you use majhul, something that you have no, no, no even prophet, no angel has access to. Jazakallah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, uh, quick question. Uh, many uh, massages in Dallas have multiple jumas, right? Some go as late as 4 p.m. Uh, what's the permissibility of just picking any one? Is there any issue? Is it dislike to go to a later one? Should we prefer to go to the, the first one? Barakallah fiqh. Alhamdulillah. With the, the issue of multiple Jumu'ahs, there's no one answer to all of the multiple Jumu'ahs. And when we ask the people of knowledge, because this is something that is new, because usually ideally, ideally is that it's one Jumu'ah, and even some of the small masajid, it used to close so that the bigger masajid will be filled with the Musalleen. 
But this is an azila. This is a, an exceptional situation, especially here in the West, where you're not allowed to pray outside the masjid. The Muslim countries, if the masjid is packed, people pray in the streets, and the, the rows, the sufuf are continuous, so it doesn't break the sufuf, so people pray. But here you you illegal to pray outside, for example. So if the masjid is is full, that means people would miss the Jumu'ah. And again, this is something that imams and mashaykh needs to consider this. It's not about my masjid that I need the people to come to pray in my masjid. This is Salatul Jumu'ah. So if Muslims go pray in another masjid, mashallah, alhamdulillah, that they pray Jumu'ah. So if the masjid are, are full with people and people, some people would miss the Jumu'ah, then that's why they would may be necessary for them to have a second Jumu'ah. But if it's my masjid, if people would miss the salah in my masjid, but they can make it in another masjid, then they should go to the other masjid. So that's why it's justified, and you know, as the ulama, they gave the ruling because it's a necessity, otherwise people would miss Jumu'ah. Can you choose? I would advise you not to choose. This is an advice. This is not a fatwa. If you have a choice, go to the first one and pray in the first one, in the first Jumu'ah. This is an advice. But if you missed it, then definitely go to whatever means that you can fulfill the Jumu'ah. Allahu Akbar. Um, so my question is regarding like creating boundaries in this generation. Um, I feel like when you're firm on your boundaries and your morals and your values, um, people will start labeling you as like, you're not really an extremist in any way. You're just following the sunnah and the, and the book itself, right, at the Quran. Um, and people will call you like Wahhabi and like all of this stuff. So it's like, how do we navigate those labels that were that are thrown at us when we're just trying to practice the sunnah? So, understand something. The people upon haq, upon the truth, upon the sunnah, have always had labels thrown at them. And that's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the sahih, authentic hadith, he told us, Bada al-Islam gharibah. Islam began as something that people saw as strange. In the Arabic language, you have ajib and gharib. Ajib is amazing. You know, something is strange, but it's, it's delightful. You say, ajab, I was amazed by it. Gharib has a connotation of negative, yani something that is objectable. And Islam is not. But when the people are lost, like the Quraysh, they had some strange practices. I mean, people forget the seerah. You know, the poor people, not everybody, but the poor were made to make tawaf naked. I mean, can you imagine people making tawaf naked? They used to have idols made out of dates, out of date, you know, that what you eat for breaking your fast. <laughs> and then they would eat them. <laughs> and this was the norm. They would have, na'udhu billah, Yani women who would have a relationship with multiple men, and then they would just pick, yeah, it's yours, you know. They didn't have a DNA test, the baby is yours, you know. So they had these strange practices where they would do all kinds of dhulam and oppression and wrong, which today even regular society would deem as strange. But they took that as the norm. So when the haq, the truth came, it was labeled as gharib. But this is why the Prophet ﷺ told us, Sayyud, it will come back gharib, something strange. Fatuba lil ghuraba. So give the glad tidings of Tuba, which is, according to the ulama, a tree in Jannah. I mean, the glad tidings of Jannah. You know, when you're given a glad tiding of a house or a tree in Jannah, some people forget the connotation, as Ibn Rajab al Hanbali explains. He said, if you're given that, that means no doubt you will go to Jannah. So it's a glad tidings to Jannah for the ghuraba, for those that people consider to be strange, odd, weird, Wahhabi, whatever you extreme, Salafist. 